Hey guys, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to this experimental episode. I'm um, gonna call it the journey to human flourishing. I'm just gonna try and interview heaps of people that I reckon are um, awesome in the movement space, but also generally in the wellness space and just keen to get anyone on that's gonna help us along the way um, to experience some human flourishing or eudaimonia. So I'll get Tom on here. Waiting for Tom. And so, while Tom gets on, um, I'll explain my relationship with Tom. So I first met Tom uh, a couple years ago. Uh, we were playing Frisbee together in, um, in a team. We went overseas and we pretty much became friends because we were both injured, which is... Um, Seems like it's taken us to here as well. Hello. Hey, dude. How you going? How you going? Good, man. Um, I've got these in, but I don't think they're connected. How's it sound? Yeah, dude. Um, I tried my AirPods too, but they don't work. So I think it's just straight up. Good old fashioned. Good old fashioned. Um, Tom, I was just explaining um, how I met you and how we got together, which was like, we were playing Frisbee together. We went overseas. We were pretty much like both, we weren't, I don't know if we full hit it off at the very start when we first met each other because we didn't really know each other. You were from Canberra, I was from Australia. And then it was kind of like one of the training camps that we were on down in Sydney or something. Um, we were both like on the sideline injured and we were both kind of like the rookie athletic dudes who weren't, who were kind of like cusp, you know, members. Um, and we, I don't know, we just got talking and then by the time we started to go overseas and have like big long travels and stuff together, effectively, I was just like interested in learning. Um, and you were like maybe three, three, three years older than me and had had significantly, like had had the life experiences that I was keen and just about to have, like been traveling by yourself for a while, we was really into philosophy and we just kind of sat on the back of the bus like for seven hours each time and just yarned hard dude and it was the best and yeah you just you just uh really sparked something in me that i think to this day is probably one of the the turning points in my life where i was just like Fuck, dude there's so much cool shit out there there's so much interesting things to think about i think you're an integral part of that um and it's and it's dope we've kept in contact tom um, yeah, it's now like a movement teacher practitioner down in Canberra. Um, I did, I was one of Tom's students, um, on his online coaching practitioner program for about six months. Um, now with someone else, but we're keeping in contact and going down to visit soon. But if you want to, Tom, um, give us a real brief intro, um, to yourself, um, and how you got into this stuff. Sure. Yeah. Um, cool to hear that our conversation sparked some interest for you. When people ask me, if someone was a few people asking, oh, who's this guy who's going to interview you? And I was like, he's kind of like a bro who became a bit of a nerd. Um, I always think of you that way. And that's what I really like about you. It's like a walking contradiction, which I love those. I love those sorts of people. Yeah. Um, bit of a bro-losopher, as my <laughs> friend and teacher Simon Tucker would say. Definitely. So for myself... I did lots of the kind of standard training growing up and played lots of sports. Rugby and cricket were my main sports and then um, was doing all the, you know, and like when I say standard stuff, like I was pretty into it. I always trained a lot and liked the gym stuff and started from a pretty early age um, doing weight training and getting stronger and thinking about um, conditioning for, for on the field and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then I had some, some bad injuries, which became chronic injuries. I had my first injury when I was six, like my first bad injury when I was 16, which was a spondy at L5S1. So people listening who aren't um, in this area who wouldn't know what that is, it's that's where one vertebra slips forward of the others. <clears throat> and there were two fractures that, that arose as a consequence of that. Uh, and I just kind of, you know, did what the physio told me to do, rested it more or less and did like a little bit of abdominal strengthening work 
um, to ease the pressure on my lower back, and it felt better for a while, and then it, and then it came back and became a chronic, a chronic issue. Uh, as well as at the same time, I had for my first subluxation of my left shoulder, which happened on playing rugby, and then that just kept happening like all the time. I I couldn't even count how many times it happened. Like it got to the point where it's happening just like my bed, my shoulder. Yeah, so my out. shoulder. Would, sorry, yeah, the shoulder slips out and goes back in. So it's not a full dislocation where it stays out. The most it was ever out for was maybe like 10 seconds. Um, but it's bad when it's out, like it's pretty severe pain. And then that shoulder was just loose and not capable of much without, without going out of, out of place. Um, mm -hmm. So those ended up being chronic issues as well as a hip, a right hip issue. We don't need to go into the details on all of them, although I've pretty much done that. Um, they ended up being chronic issues for, for many years. Uh, on reflection, it was seven years of chronic back, hip and shoulder pain and, and problems where they're constantly being re-injured and I was seeing new therapists and that sort of thing and, and toward the end of those seven years the reason things changed um, was I met through my brother Ben thanks thanks to Ben um, some awesome teachers Simon Tuckwar and Ida Portal I met them encountered them and started looking into their work and realizing that actually the things I'd been doing in terms of my training were making my injuries worse not better which is surprisingly common, but I was like, oh, but I'm getting strong and like, I'm strong and I can bench 100 kilos and so, you know, screw my shoulder for not, <laughs> for not getting better. Yeah. Um, and then the movement perspective changed, changed, changed my world. We good? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, man, I don't know what's... That's we got okay. MBN. We got MBN, yeah, I swear. <laughs> It's all good, dude. You were just saying um, that you, you, that's when you met Ido and Simon. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I started training from a movement perspective. Um, that was around five years ago now. And started transforming my body and experiencing it more as something that I could transform rather than something that was just like, you know, either strong and muscular or like fit or injured. Um, started actually like really paying attention to to the body itself and being more in like or as my body being more as my body is the way i would describe it um but that's not something you can just do all of a sudden it was something that developed over time thanks to their perspectives and their tools and and also thanks to just spending like many many hours every day practicing you end up you become whatever it is that you put your put your time into right um yeah What's that? I forget who the quote, I forget who it's, um, who it's from, but man is what he thinks about all day long. And I don't think that's true. Like that's true for most of us or at least many of us, but I think we're what we do all day long um, or what we pay attention to all day long, more, more likely. And because most of us pay attention primarily to our thoughts, then yeah, okay, we're, we're what we think about all day long. But um, yeah, that time was, was transformative for me and ended up resolving my left shoulder problem and, I'm now doing like 30 second one arm handstands on that shoulder without ever having had surgery. Um, and that was from a place where it would dislocate, dislocate diving into pools and that sort of thing. Um, and got out of pain with my back and my hip and, you know, just get, gradually became able to enjoy and feel some degree of freedom in my body and like trust my body again. So that's like the, um, that's that's the story, I suppose. Cool, man. Um, I'll we, I want to dive into this this bottom up approach to change, um, like acting ourselves into a new way of being instead of thinking ourselves. Um, and we'll bookmark that. We'll come back to it next. But I want to start off with something a little bit more on the practical side, and it's something that I think is an awesome concept for people to um, be introduced to first up, which is you talk about. I think you may have, um, you know, picked this up from your teachers, nonlinear and linear strength. So I want to know, uh, what does it look like? What does linear strength look like? And what does nonlinear strength look like? And then we'll talk about when it pops up in your programming, in your sessions. Sure. Well, a basic example is a linear version of a pulling movement would be a chin up, right? And everyone knows what a chin up is. So I don't need to explain that. A non-linear version of pulling would arise if you and I were grappling. So say we're wrestling and I'm trying to get control of your head and you're trying to get control of perhaps my arm or, um, or my hip or something like that, then I'm not always going to be pulling in the same 
direction as I would in a chin up, which would be optimal, right? Ideally I would, because that's where I'm going to be strongest. But unless I can get you into that optimally aligned position where I have trained and developed strength in that kind of more linear pattern, and we should be careful with the terminology because we don't move in lines. Like we like to think that we do, but we, we try to approximate lines. Um, there aren't any lines in the human body, but the distinction is definitely worth making. Uh, a wrestler needs to be needs to be strong in all sorts of different positions. So they're not just pulling here, but pulling out from the side and from, from above and from below so that they can get their opponent into that, into that pattern or into that line where they are strongest. Um, so that's a basic, that's a, that's a basic example. There are many, many examples of it. Um, mostly what we do in the strength and conditioning kind of world is more linear and mostly what actually happens on the field. If you want to use sports as an example is a lot of it is nonlinear, right? It's rare that you're just doing like a perfect standing vertical jump yeah. uh, up, up to catch a footy or whatever it is that you, that you're catching. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think, um, I think it kind of relates to this, this principle that kind of comes up a lot in this world, which is kind of said, said principle, specific adaptations to impose demands. You get better at exactly what you do, exactly what you practice. And as you're saying, if what we need to be good at is mainly nonlinear, if when we change directions, we're not usually in optimal alignment or when someone hits us, we're not in optimal alignment or when we need to jump or produce power, then we'll revert to what we've practiced, which is being able to produce safe, stable power within alignment. And when we get out of that alignment is also when we get injured. And so, yeah. you know, the material that we worked on with all of the different kind of squatting, putting purposely like forwards pressure, backwards pressure, rotational pressure, sideways or both ways pressure through the knees is an example of, um, of that kind of work to really confront those situations. There might be danger within valgus knee or when your knee starts going inwards. And if you, if you stabilize and if you gain strength in that range, when you get forced into it in a random situation, you might be more likely to save yourself the injury. Slow down the force that's ripping through that joint. Um, yeah, if it's the first time it's happened that you've never gone out of alignment in your training, then chances are you get injured. And like you said, all the injuries happen, almost all the injuries happen out of, alignment out of optimal alignment mm -hmm. uh and actually i think your risk of injury is higher the, so you could think about you want to be able to generate force in optimal alignment right that's what we think of as performance training for performance but you also want to be able to tolerate force outside of optimal alignment and that's what we think about as injury resilience although most of us just think of it as rehab we do it after the injury or it already happens right so the your likelihood of being injured is not so much correlated with how much force you can generate or how much you can tolerate it's with the ratio between the two yeah. so if you can generate a lot of force but you can't in alignment in perfect alignment but you can't tolerate much out of alignment you're much more likely to get injured than if you can't generate much force or tolerate much force which is why you see so many athletes get injured get their first serious injuries soon after starting weight training programs like younger athletes they'll start doing weights and getting really strong in optimal alignment but they haven't increased the ceiling on their suboptimal alignment, their ability to tolerate force. So they get mm. injured, even though they might be faster and stronger and, and all these sorts of things that they get injured soon after. And of course, <laughs> when you get injured, your ability to perform in optimal alignment drops to zero anyway. So like we should really be pri prioritizing that resilience to a greater degree than we are. For sure, man. And I definitely like that that little like story that you told relates so much to my own body and my own athleticism because as i said we were in that frisbee team because we were like the athletes who were who weren't that good at frisbee but just if you slide if you threw it we'd run real fast and we'd catch it and looking back on my journey as an athlete the the like the miraculousness of the fact that i didn't do like an acl but learning about it in anatomy i'm just like whack like we're learning about there's three forces that make an ACL like injury when you're doing a step on a 45 degree angle. I'm just thinking how, like how weak I was and how much, cause the, like, I had an easy time generating force and I was fast and powerful. But if you pause the video of me at the bottom of that vertical jump, it'd be knees in everything collapsed, you know, and, and it's yeah, 
and I had that ceiling, you know, it's like I was expressing so highly without ca capacity, you know, and it's the same thing with, um, like, uh, same thing with the distinction between bilateral and unilateral lower body movements, two foot and one foot. Um, I was coaching yesterday and there was a, um, uh, and there was someone who could make the shape of a bilateral squat really well, really flexible dancer, um, female dancer, could make a squat shape with the bar on her back really well. But then when we went to just an, a, a body weight um, uh, Bulgarian split squat, so imagine you're in a lunge, but your back foot is elevated and you're just going down and up. So in that, the amount of hip instability and hip drop that there was was so surprising. And it's the same thing where you can express yourself so highly. And some people have, some bodies, people's bodies have figured out a way to express so highly without any capacity. If you imagine a pyramid of their athleticism, it's built like this thin all the way up, you know, and there's nothing underneath it. There's no capacity. Um, and yeah, uh, so I think, this nonlinear stuff is super important. Um, but in terms of what, uh, when it gets pro, when it gets programmed and it, so when does it get, when, when does it get taught by you in a session of praxis? And maybe when does it get programmed for someone like me as a student um, of yours uh, in my, my programming, in my journey? Mm. Yeah, so. The suboptimally aligned material where we're strengthening connective tissue in more vulnerable positions is something that we'll normally do after the more optimally aligned linear type of strength work because they, that's your stabilizing work, right? So if you're destroying, if you're fatiguing all your stabilizers and then you try to go into heavy lifting or jumping or whatever, you're trying to express power having worn down all your stabilizers and worn, not worn down, but, you know, challenge that connective tissue. In the yeah. moment after you challenge it, that's not when it's strong, right? It's after you sleep and wake up the next day, then it's stronger. Um, so you're more likely to get injured if you, if, if I'm going to go and play a sport now, if I'm going to go play a game of ultimate now, I'm not going to start with a bunch of weird misaligned squatting patterns to strengthen the connective tissue out of alignment. Because then if I go out of alignment in the game, all those, all those muscles and connective tissues that, that are used to, that I've fatigued, they're too fatigued to tolerate those forces, so I get injured. So normally it comes after. Having said that, it, like you asked about, okay, in a session, often we'll use some of the more nonlinear, open, play-based movements to prep the body at the start of a session as well. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also the question of, well, what would you do with different individuals? So for instance, I mean, most people, you can also think of this in another way, which is, the linear stuff is more ordered and structured and the non-linear material is often more open and chaotic, right? But intentionally chaotic, like controlled chaos. And if you get someone, if we get someone in who's done no real physical training or just done a few bits and pieces here and there, chances are they're already in more or less a state of chaos. It's not one that they've de decided to be in, yeah. but they're just exposed to whatever forces arose in their lives and their bodies there's no order there's no structure in the body yeah so with that sort of person i would bring i would start with the linear structured ordered material first focusing on okay well this is hip flexion this is hip extension this is how you rotate your spine this is how you laterally flex this little part of your spine and this is how you retract the scapula and protract the scapula and we introduce all this terminology and structure and order into the system mm -hmm. and then expose it to chaos because sometimes if you just straight away go like okay open movement scenario like anything goes and just see what happens the person gets injured because they're not capable of of dealing with that at all you need to b build some resilience for some terminology in their body whereas maybe if i got someone in and they came into their first class and they're a physio who spent we did a workshop on the weekend that focused on rehabilitation and you know how physios are and partly it's like you need to be quite intelligent to get into physiotherapy so there's already a selection bias there for people who are going to have that more intellectual like yeah but don't things work in yeah. this like this alignment this alignment this structure order so maybe that person needs more chaos straight away like or they're a strength and conditioning coach and they're already really strong they've got a good squad and they've got um a, a solid push and pull in their upper body and so on you take them into more chaotic stuff and go, hey, okay, you're, you're great in alignment. 
with a bilateral squat. But like you said, what if I put you on one leg and then ask you to explore all the possible alignments on one leg and they realize, oh, actually, they're not capable of moving freely at all, only in the ordered ways they've prepared. So it, it, it's differing ratios of the, of the two things at different times of the year, even, and at different times of people's lives and, and, and for different people as well. One of those big, like, it depends answers. Yeah, well, dude, um, sometimes I'll ask you questions today with the knowledge that it's, it's the, the answer is always, it depends. But ultimately, I think the value that, that we can provide as coaches, people who understand and respect the complexity of the human body and how it relates to others and, the, and like the psychology as well, is managing that complexity, structuring it, and like getting a little bit of isolated tidbit, for sure, with the, con with, with the caveat of, but it depends, but it's contextual, but I'll have to see you and like, you know, that kind of things. But um, yeah, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be playing, you know, a, a bit of a, a dance around that um, contextual yeah. and concrete thing today. Um, mm. And so let's, um, let's hop into about, uh, you talk about potential and also being and becoming. And you use those words a bit um, when we've had chats and in your other podcasts that you've been on. And I'm just kind of like interested in what, in, uh, in what you mean by those words and how that may, like, how that may relate to the name of, of your movement studio in Canberra. Yeah. Yeah, so pull me back if it's too abstract, but I'll try to make it as concrete as possible or as accessible as possible. For sure. and, these are all things that, and they're all things that we know, right? They're just terms that like encompass things that we already know. So if you want to think about the distinction between being and becoming, it's basically a distinction between orienting toward the future, which is becoming, and orienting toward the present, which is, which is being. So I can be in this moment and I can become something else tomorrow, right? And I think about it in the sense that we're, we seem to be unique in our comprehension of the future that we know that the future exists like other animals know to some extent or perhaps their instinctual behaviors like i've got the dogs here with me they'll bury bones right and it's like oh they know that they'll get that bone later so they're behaving as if they know that the future exists but they'll bury the bone even if you're in a place there's no way you're going back to like you're visiting a friend interstate with the dog they'll bury bone there so it's like okay there's, there's a little bit less you know it's a, it's a slightly less complex understanding of the future. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's agree on that. We know more about the future, it seems, or about what, what, what's likely to happen in our futures. Not that we can predict everything, but we're sure of a few things like death uh, than, than other creatures. And so we have, to, we have to grapple with that. And that's the domain of becoming. Uh, if, if we're not, if we don't feel like we're moving towards something, then we become depressed. That's almost the definition of depression. Things aren't getting better. And nihilism is like along the same dimension, right? It's a similar sort of state. Um, so we need to feel like what we're doing now is going to make our lives better tomorrow. It's going to make uh, our, the people we love, their lives better tomorrow. It's going to make the world better tomorrow. That the world and our lives and the lives of the people around us are becoming something better, something improved um, through, through what we're doing. And that's why we don't just sit home sucking on sugar cubes, right? Like we go to work because we know... <laughs> Okay, I need to do things that are for the future. And also you could think of it this way. Like if you want to go with the just follow your bliss and enjoy every moment, you know, um, with no regard for the future, then like think about how we treat people uh, who we want to punish, like criminals. We put them in prison and we strip them of their future. We give them food, water, shelter. They get health care. Like, they're, okay, they're less safe probably <laughs> given who else is in prisons. But like... We, we describe that as inhumane. Or think about refugees in detention centers. Why is that inhumane? Because they don't know when they're getting out, because they've been stripped of their future. That's inhumane, it's not human. So if you think about that, the way we describe those things as inhumane, then to be humane, to be human, is to have a future and a plan for the future, to be becoming, right? That's the domain of becoming. On the flip side of that, also we need to be in the present moment. So we need to orient toward the present as well. Because if we don't, we're just riddled with anxiety. You think about the definition of anxiety. It's anxiety is concern for the future. And we can 
more often we're talking about negative concern. Oh, I'm anxious about what might happen. But also before this chat, I was like anxious to have the chat. You know, we also yeah. talk about it in a positive way. But regardless, we're defining it as a future orientation. I'm either looking forward to or afraid of what might happen in the future. Um, so I need to be present in this conversation as well. Um, and what I try to do, and I think a good way to think about it is organize my life so that the activities I'm engaging in each day are activities that I can be fully in, fully present in, in every moment to whatever extent that's possible, which is difficult, of course, but also organize things so that those activities that I'm fully present in are likely to create a better tomorrow and a better the day after, a better future. So I'm trying to like be in the moment in a way that allows me to become something more uh, moving forward. And that's, you know, that's like the whole thing of potential. I mean, that's what we, they're the people that we look up to and they're the people that we respect to the people who are exploring potential. And the reason we don't do that is because we're used to what is, right? We're comfortable with what is. We can grapple, we can grapple with it because we have grappled with it already. That's the actuality. That's how things actually are now potentiality, potential, or they're all the things that could be. Well, what could be? But actually, in my mind, that, that's what's most exciting about being alive is, and being human specifically is that we can apprehend what could be. We can see how things are. We can see what is. And then we can imagine what could be, right? And then we can act so that what we saw becomes what we imagined. Uh, and everything that we describe is like uniquely human. And everything that we describe as human progress is a result of that capacity, that seemingly unique capacity we have to grapple with a future that doesn't yet exist, to grapple with potential, to see that the tree could become timber and that the timber could become a table and then to act so that, oh, now I have a, now I have a table. I constructed a table. Um, so we see the potential in the world, but also in ourselves, right? I see that I could become a person who answers in a more concise, less elaborated, less, you know, abstract philosophical way to a question <laughs> um and so maybe i try to become that person or maybe i don't right becoming again i see the potential in myself and actually the trouble is man and we'll go on to the next topic i'm sure but we're more likely to see the potential in other people than in our in ourselves mm -hmm. because our own potential frightens us and it's like a um you know it's like a we don't feel good because we're not there yet. <laughs> so it's a source of negative emotion, our own potential. Whereas for someone else, we're like encouraging them. Like, come on, you can do, you can do more, right? I'm disappointed you didn't do what you could have. Uh, so partly it's kind of adopting that perspective on yourself and looking for the domains where you could be improving, where your potential lies dormant. And this is why I love the physical practices because every single cell in your body, there's potential there for it to change. Um, and it just requires doing things a little bit different, just doing things a little bit differently. And I'm sure that, you know, you asked about the name of the facility practice. That's what it's about, right? It's practicing, repeating. Um, I'll let you respond to, to what I've said, but. Yeah, man, like that, that's that awesome context that you just gave and led into why you call it praxis is like, is the, is the interesting thing about this landscape. And I think it's, I think on the embodiment level, as in like being in a body and like seeing your body is more than just a brain taxi on that level, that's where the, the practice stuff really comes in. And we're talking about enacting change from the bottom up. And for example, before the uh, thing today, uh, before our conversation, I had myself set up in the garage and I was like, everything's good. I'm not going to be interrupted, not here. Like, this is all good. Everything sounds going to be sick. And then just down at the school, it's lunchtime. And I'm like doing a little like test recording of the video. I'm like, Fuck. it's uh, all these kids are going to be in the video and it's all, all the kids are going to be recording. It's going to be annoying. And what allowed me to deal with that was a breathing practice that I did beforehand. There's this YouTube video. It's, there's just a dude. There's a bit of music. And it's just like a number of inhales and exhales to different beats that are pretty intense with a few breath holds. And it's just like, that's a way in which your, your, you can affect your state bottom up. You can act yourself into a new way of being in the moment. And I think that that's one of the biggest lessons and take homes for, for, from this kind of like community. And I think that the way that I see it, like Ido, who we'll talk about next, 
led the way in terms of like the general ideas. And now I think the culture is kind of becoming something that maybe he would look at and be like, is that really, you know, like is, cause he's, he's so much of a thinker and a doer and a lot of people in the community, not as engaged in the ideas, but more in the movements, which is absolutely fine because the movements are, are beneficial as well. Um, but I think that's where the, the, the conversation and the, the, yeah, the conversation in this culture is kind of expanding to like breathing practices and then like what it is to be being and what it is to be practicing for not just yourself, but as you said, on those three levels, like things that are good for you, that are good for the people around you and, and for good uh, things that are good for the, the world at large. And those three things being in line is like super powerful. Um, and as you said, that's why you name your place Praxis. And when I think about, you know, what I want to call a facility in the future, I'm like, fuck, you kind of stole the good Take name. Take <laughs> you know? Don't worry, we'll, we'll franchise it out. You I know, that's what I was thinking. Pick I was like, up 10%. <laughs> maybe, we could, maybe we could double up. Um, but uh, all right, moving on. So okay. next question is, you've been a student of Ido's for a while and you've um, been to a couple of his workshops and had a bit of like, you know, more... Uh, personal interaction with him and his students what do you think the biggest like lesson or two that you've really picked up from Ido and that kind of side of things is mm. um yeah Ido gets misrepresented a lot because people just see his stuff online and like I'm not one of his closest students but I've been to maybe eight different events. Two of them were week-long movement camps. Another one was a week-long um, movement meeting in Europe. And I've been doing online coaching for five years. So I think compared to like what most people will say about him, <laughs> I probably know more. Um, <laughs> but then compared to a group of like maybe 30 to 50 um, practitioners in the movement domain. And then of course, all the people who are actually around him um, in his life. I know less, right? But you know, that's, that's context. The things that I learned from him um, that I found most valuable as a practitioner, as a mover, as a practitioner of movement, and also just as a person um, would be the value of repetition. So Ido, Ido's got this reputation for being like insane on volume. Like, okay, we're not just going to do this a few times. We're going to do it uh, for enough times until you're completely bored of it. Um, and, and, you know, often the, there's a dichotomy set up between quantity and quality. Uh, partly I think people, I mean, and of course it depends on how you do You have to do things with quality. Um, that focus is there too. But when you set them up against each other and claim that, well, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. That's like a lazy, it's an easy out, right? If you don't want to put the work in and normally it's the quantity that breeds quality. You have to spend enough time in the practice or in the, uh, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be a practice in the field that you're trying to become develop expertise in. You have to repeat, you have to repeat. And if you can repeat to the point where you get bored, then that moment of boredom where you realize you're bored is like, hey, I actually bring your attention back. Bring your attention back. Oh, we're bored? Bring your attention back because there's almost always more depth. Like there is always more depth. There's sure. always more to discover if you're curious, if you take that approach to it. But if you just go through the motions, that doesn't happen. So that would be one thing, the value with repetition going and doing things a lot and just trusting. And this is the, um, you know, studied philosophy before and the intellect doesn't really understand this. This is the experiential dimension is trusting that if you do the thing a lot of times, a thousand reps of something, it's going to feel very different from a hundred reps. And then once you're 10,000 reps in, you look back on your 1000 rep self and be like, Oh man, I knew nothing about this practice. And then a hundred thousand reps in, it's like reading a book. It's rereading a book you read when you were 10 years younger. You're yeah. like, oh, dude, I thought I understood this. Now I understand it. Yeah. And that happens enough that you think, well, I don't understand it. <laughs> no matter what, there'll always mm -hmm. be more layers. So next time I read, anyway, I'm going on a tangent. Um, that would be one thing as a practitioner. As a teacher, what I really love about Ido and, and I think what's most compelling about him is the intensity he brings to his teaching and the passion he brings to his teaching. He's like fully there in it when he's teaching and giving everything. Right. And the reason we don't do that is because there's vulnerability associated with that. Like if you're fully in it and someone doesn't respond well, then <laughs> that's fully on you. But if I can just pretend to be someone else in this in interview and then someone comments and goes like, oh, this guy's a wanker, 
then it's like, well, I wasn't being myself anyway, so I'm not insulted. Exactly. But if I'm being fully in it, fully myself, and trying to fully express and just, you know, give that intensity of the passion from your practice to your teaching, then it's completely different from this for the students and for you as the teacher. Um, it's it's an awesome. It's my favorite thing to do is to be fully in it when I'm when I'm teaching teaching movement or teaching anything really. Um, they're probably the two main things, and of course all the different movements and and a lot of different ideas and perspectives. But they're the two more general points that I'd say I've tried to uh, steal and take into my into my life. For sure, yeah. I think the the concept that you talked about in terms of like the intellectual understanding versus the experiential understanding. That's something that I didn't really understand before, for example, because I thought here's a perfect example, right? So we've been friends for like at least a couple of years and you'd already been interested in Ido when we first met. So you'd be talking to me heaps about him. And I felt like I listened to all of, all of the podcasts of all the cool movement people and all the people who think a little bit differently, but talk heaps about different kind of training. And before I started with you, I was like, I've definitely like, you know, I know so much of this shit. I've done a cooked amounts of research because I love to live in that input landscape mm -hmm. and because it's easier and there's no danger in it as well. Um, mm -hmm. But the output landscape, when I started online coaching with you, is just like, yeah, hugely different. And, and, and like has, has uh, you know, since, since I started, it's massively changed, you know, like what I'm doing and who I've been, you know, hooked up with in, in Brisbane and everything like that. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's super interesting that, that landscape of actually doing the stuff and it changing yeah. ways that you're not able to predict and kind of chasing that quality, that closing that gap on things and is just insanely interesting. Um, it's, it's curiosity. Like it's genuine curiosity <laughs> that's the mode that you're putting yourself in. And like, that's such a rare mode, unfortunately. Um, for people to put themselves in. Like, I, if you're not compelled and you're like, oh, yeah, I kind of get it already. I haven't done any of this stuff, but I've heard these guys talk about it for half an hour, so I kind of get it. Then you know how everyone who's just had a child says, oh, you don't understand the love that, you know, I feel for my child. And everyone who hasn't had one yet is like, yeah, I think I probably kind of do understand it. Yeah. You know? But actually, if everyone's saying it, you probably don't understand it at all until you have the experience. And that's what the practice is like. It's like, you just have to kind of find a teacher you trust. And they say, you know, without arrogance, because that can also happen, like with the enlightened guru, ah, you're looking for this experience I've had and you can never have, you know, that, that's definitely a thing that can be a problem when the mm -hmm. ego comes back in. But just trusting, like, there's something there. And if I keep peeling back the layers and I keep being in the practice and being present in the practice, like we spoke about, that being, operating in that being mode during the practice, trusting that you'll become that it will evolve and become something else and become something more meaningful um it, it, it and it does like it pretty much always does if you're curious there's something there no matter yeah. what you're curious about uh, yes. and i can so I find think, you go oh i said seek and you shall find you know it's like exactly, exactly. and it's because just just the just the projection as you're talking about just the projection like the questioning that's why that's why i did my thesis on that's why questioning is so incredible for learning and teaching but just the enactment of asking a question automatically presupposes that there is an answer or there could be an answer and automatically orients your information processing systems and your actions to fulfilling that particular like reality that you've just kind of like come up with and by that's the process of being curious and by never taking things on face value and by being like how if I was to like Yuval Noah Harari talks about it as pretty much the reason why the West expanded through the continents and for example, China didn't because the Chinese uh, like, like philosophy was, he says more based around um, was, was more comfortable with, with what they had and what they knew. And the West had this scientific revolution that assumed ignorance and, and therefore facilitated curiosity and drove them to, to sail out off to the edge of the flat disk that turned out then to be America and that turned out to then be the world. Um, but so we've got about 15 minutes left. I want to start getting some rapid fire questions. So here you're going to practice being tangible and concrete. <laughs> <laughs> and so first one. Purchase under a hundred dollars that is 
indispensable or incredibly useful or facilitating of movement. One or two or three, whatever you think is just a nice, cheap, awesome thing. For example, I got a slack line for 110 bucks and it's insanely fun and it's incredible for your hips and it's just a banger. It's a, it, I'm going to bring it to the uh, to camping on the weekend. Everyone's going to have a go. It's going to be sick. So what do you reckon? If you spend a lot of time at home, buy a desk that sits on the floor. It doesn't sound exciting. No one's going to be like, oh, but the slack line, yeah, I'll buy, buy the desk. But it'll change the way you rest. And actually, because we spend most of our time at rest, it'll have a bigger impact on your body than the 10, 15, 20 minutes of slack lining you might do three times a week. For sure. Um, so I'd do that or spend a hundred bucks on getting someone to get some of the furniture out of your house and forcing you to spend some time on the floor more yeah. often. Um, folding the body up, flexing the knees, spending time in dors full dorsiflexion of the ankle, all these sorts of things. They're incredibly beneficial and they're things we just don't do because of the technologies we've developed, i.e. furniture, to avoid having to do those things. Yeah. And Rapid. I Huh? Rapid. Rapid. Good, dude. I thought you were going to go on a tangent there for a second. I was like... I know. I caught myself. So did I. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, yeah, man. I think that... Uh, and, and I'd love to do another one of these conversations and get into Nassim Taleb and his thinking and how it relates to this world. But it's kind of that via negativa approach. Take out the things that are negative inputs, chairs, sitting, comfortableness, and you're just left to effectively do your mobility practice subconsciously on the ground while you work. Yeah. Uh, awesome, man. So um, I'm conscious that some of the people that are watch this uh, will be on the spectrum between movement teachers deep in the world and complete beginners don't know anything to um, don't know anything about it. So like name a couple teachers or practitioners that people should look up and check out and, and, that may, you know, be different thinking to the people that they're used to. I mean, of course, I'm going to name my teachers. Um, if you haven't looked into Ido's stuff, look into it. If you haven't looked into Simon Tuckhaw's ancestral movement stuff, look into that. Uh, the... Can I answer this a little more longly? <laughs> you got a minute. <laughs> oh, dude, I can't. <laughs> look. look. Here's the thing is what I was going to say this before with like the arrogance of the intellect where it just thinks it understands something and oh yeah, job done message received. Like, no, you have to do the practice is it doesn't matter who you look up and what you look up about them. If you're not changing the way that you move. So yeah. the priority should be on that. Like start, get a morning practice, start with a, with a morning routine. When you get out of bed, look up. Okay. Here's something you can look up, look up spinal waves. And I think Joseph Bartz, um, Joseph Bartz has some good videos on this on YouTube, free videos on how to do spinal waves. Just set yourself a task of doing five minutes of spinal waves when you wake up in the morning and do it every day for 30 days and see how your body feels at the end of that. And if that's too much, then set yourself a task of sitting still or lying down and feeling what it feels like to breathe for five minutes when you get out of bed every morning. And don't even try to breathe a certain way. Don't worry about what posture you're in. Like, just slap on the couch. It doesn't matter. But try not to get distracted. Whenever you do, try to bring your attention back to what it feels like to breathe, to the sensations of breathing, uh, and try not to move. Set, you the set yourself the constraint. I'm not going to move for five minutes. Set a timer. Move when it goes off. And feel what's moving when you're not moving because there's still a lot going on. And that might be one little access point to start starting to pay attention to the body and give it a little bit of the respect that it deserves that we that we don't give that we don't give ourselves right, as embodied creatures. Sure, man. Um, and I was another um, another question that I had a bit further down, and I think I know your answer, but who knows? Is kind of what you alluded to there, and, and it was like name the biggest force multiplier or keystone habit change that can help people start in increasing their movement and whatnot. And my answer to that would be some kind of stillness practice, whether it be focusing on the breath, whether it be meditation, whether it be a breathing practice, because that is a, a habit and B usually facilitates the kind of state of it quietens the thing in myself. That's like, Oh, I've got to do my spinal waves. And I just kind of start doing them. And then that thing comes up and I'm like, whoa, that came up a little bit later. And I'm already, uh, I'll just do my two minutes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Kind of yeah. Just make it automatic. Get up, set the timer, do the thing. 
And the practice itself doesn't matter too much. It's like, do something that's so basic that it requires no equipment and you can do it every day. Spinal waves, paying attention to the breath. Um, if you have someone you can hang, that's something Edo popular, popularized, just hang for as long as you can and then come down. And then tomorrow, try to hang for another second or two seconds and then do that and just see, does it have an effect? Just see, does it have an effect? And it probably does because like, the key, the keystone, like the force multiplier, the change that has to happen is that we stop viewing our bodies as like foreign machines that we're operating, like foreign machines that are operated by and for the sake of the brain, the mind, but as us, you're a body. You're not just in a body, you're embodied. Like that shift has to happen and happening as a consequence of listening to this con conversation is not what I'm talking about. It's like, the same thing i was thinking about it earlier okay i understand that i'm gonna die but to what extent do i really understand that like have i embodied that knowledge and the truth is for me i don't think i have i haven't um and you can tell when someone has like when they really mean it oh yeah like that's there in that person um so we can have an intellectual understanding of something which is completely different and distinct from the the um experiential understanding when you unite the two things that's when that's when cool things happen that's when it's exciting i think um so just know that or be aware of that acknowledge that um and see if you can start not just thinking about your body as not a machine but as you but experiencing it that way seeing it that way actually seeing other bodies that way as the complex things that they are the complex organisms that have evolved over billions of years <laughs> uh, yeah. to become what they are yeah, not just like a machine with the brain that's the processor. And, you know, it's so crude uh, and like deme demeaning. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to plug in my computer. I'll be one second. Okay. All righty. Um, uh, 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 oh. All righty. Um, so let's go. What are some... What are some maybe mistakes that you see most frequently within your own community of students, maybe within like the greater like sphere as well, but also the ones that you've missed you've made. Like if you were to warn, if you were to just tell someone and they're like, I'm going to commit six hours a day for the next six years. And I'm going to do it hard. What would you, would you give them any like uh, warnings of like, of things that they want to avoid doing or mistakes that you or you've seen other people make getting into this uh the, any realizations that need to happen will happen and the mistakes that bring those realizations about kind of just have to happen again it's that experiential thing like all the mistakes i've made as a practitioner made me a far better teacher so they were useful in in that regard uh i would say know that like better to know that you're going to make mistakes and that you're not right. You know, there's the um, Dunning-Kruger effect. People can look that up. It's this basic chart that shows some, our perception of our ability or knowledge in any domain. When we move into the domain, our perception of how much we know skyrockets, right? And then as we spend more time in that field, it plummets. And then as we actually develop expertise, it starts creeping back up again, which is why someone who's just got into fitness is like an expert, you know, and they'll talk to someone who's spent the last five years studying strength and conditioning and talk as if they know, or like someone who's just got into a new way of eating. They're like an expert. And it's just such a, uh, it's so annoying. <laughs> it's so annoying. Um, so you have to do that enough times to realize that you're never an expert and that there's like infinite, an infinite amount of things that you don't know and that you won't know. Um, but maybe you can start knowing and learning some of them. So, you know, mistakes, just go into it with humility and, and acknowledge that everyone's at a different place and you're on your crusade, perhaps your campaign to become, you know, but like, it's not all about you. It's also about the other people and where they're at. And if you're going to be a teacher, especially, or you're going to try to share some of the tools with your friends and family, don't do it from a place of, like arrogance where oh i know so much more than the guy who's just doing like you know burpees in the park it's like that's where that guy's at right now and 
maybe I can provide something that's useful if he's interested, but if he's not, I probably can't. And that's fine because I used to be the guy doing burpees in the park. So that like, you know, humility regarding rereading a book, that same perspective, like I know I'm probably wrong about lots of stuff right now. So I should just operate from that place already um, rather than assuming somewhat even near perfect knowledge uh, for myself. Yeah. That's awesome, I man. I don't know how helpful that is, but like, Dude, I think, I think that's great, man. I think that that kind of links back around into that experiential understanding. Like, sure, we could warn you of particular mistakes, but ultimately it's the attitude towards orienting towards like running, to, running forward fast, practicing a lot and expecting that there's going to be mistakes happen. And I think that that's, that's a much more powerful answer. And I think the humility thing is a, is a massive thing as well. And Maybe in our next conversation, we can get into that as it relates to teaching, because I think there are a lot of pitfalls in terms of teaching, as you're saying, in terms of being the one that, the one that knows instead of the one that is trying to find out with others, the one that's asking their students about what they think, you know, because um, ultimately, if you, if, you, if you lack that curiosity, as we were saying, the moment you think you know, that's when you cooked, you know? Yeah, it's over. Then it's over. Yeah. And the thing is reality dynamic so if your knowledge is stable then you're not keeping up <laughs> reality is changing that's the thing you can't find perfect balance oh, i'm trying to find balance in my work life you know work life balance perfect balance i've got the perfect diet and that lasts a week because we're always recalibrating back towards center and falling off center and coming back and falling off center and we do this in a physical sense when we're balancing and that's um that's the skill of the handstand, for instance, or any type of balance is falling off center and coming back, falling off center and coming back. But we do that in our lives as well. Um, going too much into one thing and then coming a bit back towards the center and then you go too far the other extreme, you come back towards the center and you're constantly recalibrating. Um, so just knowing that there's no perfect, there's no perfect balance um, because reality is changing. So you always have to be changing, right? All right, man, we've got about a minute left. Um if you so what advice would you give your 16 to 18 year old self i would say aside from all the say watch this talk <laughs> um in the, from a movement perspective i would say start viewing your body as you and not as a machine uh, start thinking about your joints and their functions rather than your muscles and their functions because muscles are only important insofar as what they can do for your joints. And I'm not just talking about joint health. Like I don't care about bicep contraction. I care about elbow flexion. And actually maybe I don't care about elbow flexion. I care about pulling, right? So broadening yeah. the perspective on what the body is. Um, that would be a piece of advice. I think that's I think that's it. I think that's a good piece of advice. View the body as yourself. It's not a machine. You're gonna you're wrong about lots of things, and you're gonna continue being wrong and being proven wrong and learning um, forever. And yeah, don't assume that that you're in the right place now or that you ever will be. It's a continual evolution, and that's what's exciting. Adopt that humility. Um, yeah, just being like a switched on person is you know it's not a big it's not a big deal doesn't make you superior um dampening that intellectual arrogance a little bit would have been useful for me at that age yeah awesome man um such a dope conversation and i'm super stoked that you are that you got on with me today took out some time um to have the conversation um I'd love to have another one at some point. There's things in terms of Simon Tucker. I know that he's got incredible perspectives that uh, you share as well um, through like, it's, it's a big topic, but it's yeah. awesome. And I'd love to pick your brains about that and about um, teaching and what it is to be a, teaching, a teacher. So um, thank you so much for coming on, man. Um, hopefully we get another one of these sorted soon. Like COVID's been a stitch up again in uh, Australia. So we'll see how I go getting down there soon, but ideally get down to Praxis, train with you guys, uh, meet all your friends again, because um, you guys have got a really awesome community down there. And 
if you guys haven't check out Praxis on Instagram or Tom and just have a look at what they're doing. Hit them up if you want to get involved. But uh, yeah, man, thanks so much for coming on. Any last things you want to say? There's plenty, but I think we're out of time. So we'll save them for next time. Thanks for having me, man. That was a pleasure. Sorry about the internet uh, failures at the beginning. I don't know what happened, but um, yeah, look, just, just people who are, who are interested, engage in the practice. Think about, don't just think about it. <laughs> don't just look it up. Don't just research it online. Research your body. Research it experientially. Research it practically. That's what causes transformation. That's what makes things different. And that'll ripple out and start affecting the way you think. Um, like you said, that bottom-up transformation is, is absolute gold. And that's why I love the movement stuff. Um, it's just one instantiation of that. It's one expression of that. Um, but it's an immediate Instant. one. But yeah, we're in a body, so start there. Awesome, man. Uh, thanks so much for coming on, dude. See you All soon. Right. Talk again soon. Cheers, dude. Catch ya.